A um, couple other reminders that we just want to give um, as we get started today. Um, we are now on uh, Twitter um, and people can find us there at um, at Roadmap Summit and hashtag Grasslands Roadmap. So if anybody is posting any feeds or comments, um, please use those. Again, we'll put those in the chat box. Um, and then we also want to just spend a minute looking at today's agenda and, and where we're headed and what to expect over the next couple hours. So for anybody watching, the agenda page on the website is really a key place to go back to, to get live links for connecting. Um, for the different sessions when we come back together on the 23rd and then throughout the end of July and August. Um, and this is also a great place to see all the resources. If you miss a part of the talks uh, or if you miss one of the sessions, we are posting videos from each of the, the sessions here. Um, they're broken out by the different panels. So if you just missed one of the, the panels or one of the talks, you can always go there. Um, our YouTube channel always has all the different videos as well. And anytime we have it, we can post the PowerPoint to the presenters. It's not possible with everybody who's presenting, but you can go back and access any of the names that are underlined. You can go back and access those PowerPoints. Um, and that brings us to today. We're going to start off here in just a minute, hearing from leaders from different sectors. Um, really, really great talks from a number of the partners who are involved in this summit um, and who have been playing a, a big role in bringing it together some really great programs and ideas that are out there in the central grasslands. And then that will be followed by a second panel that will start uh, just after one o'clock, um, hearing from uh, indigenous voices, perspective from Mexico and a perspective from Canada um, and some things going on in, in, on their land and what they're looking at in programs as well. So that's where we're headed today. And as a reminder, we're back for the third session in this series um, next Thursday on July 23rd, same time different Zoom links. With that, uh, I, I want to introduce um, our first panelist for today, um, Jim Eckberg. And they're going to be sharing a, a variety of different thoughts. And the goal for this panel is really to set the stage for delegates to think about how we can work within that partnership and engagement and collaboration. And what we're finding through the conversation that's been happening and the, the delegate survey that was submitted uh, is we really in this process need to refine how we collaborate with one another and how we get on the same page and where those different points of overlap might be, how we might measure that success. So hopefully the, the speakers today are really going to give us a, a foothold into talking about those different elements and how that can influence the way we think about the roadmap and think about how we can step outside of our own work, our own sector, and, and think in that more collaborative, um, integrated way as, as we work on the roadmap. Tammy uh, or anybody else, do you wanna add anything to the framing for today's panel? Okay. No, I just appreciate all the expertise and energy here and wanna make sure we can dive in so folks can ask questions. Perfect. All right, so Jim, I will, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Matt, and thank you, Tammy, and the others that um, were key in organizing the, the roadmap in this uh, webinar. And so just to do a quick check on audio, Matt, if you can, if you can verify. Yep, sounding, sounding good. Sounding good, thank well, you. Well, that's, that's great. So as we think about the, the, the Great Plains and the grasslands, uh, the one of the focuses here of course is on grassland habitat but as we all know grasslands occur uh, in a matrix of other habitats and this is where general mills works is in crop production um, sourcing oats wheat uh, dairy across the great plains and and just to kick it off um, you know why 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 a food company um, so General Mills, um, you know, we've been in business for 150 years, over 150 years, and and we recognize as a company that if we want to be in business for the next 150 years, we need to fundamentally rethink and redesign our supply chains, the the environments uh, where we source our ingredients, 
to build resiliency back into them, both from an economic as well as an environmental standpoint. And biodiversity is one of the key aspects of that resiliency. And so as we think about this today and think about new ways of working in new partnerships, we are very excited about the roadmap and um, the opportunity to collaborate on bird conservation and biodiversity conservation more broadly um, through our regenerative uh, pilot, regenerative agriculture pilot. So I will just take 10 minutes to briefly talk about the issues that are facing um, agriculture very briefly, uh, what our, our regenerative agriculture initiative is, and get more into the substance of where we hope to collaborate and work together. So there's, there's no mistake in it, agriculture coming out of World War II, uh, what became heavily mechanized, uh, industrialized, focused on a small handful of crops. And though we solved a lot of the major issues of the time in the mid-century, we created a whole host of other issues one of which is biodiversity loss, but it goes well beyond that to declining farm profitability and impacts, of course, to greenhouse gases, uh, the loss of our topsoil to the, you know, the Gulf of Mexico. And we think that regenerative agriculture is the pathway back to that. So biodiversity, just to focus on this, we, we now rely, um, you know, on just a small handful of crops to, to support our food system. And this uh, reliance on monocultures combined with uh, reliance on heavy tillage and cultivation and the use of pesticides has really led to a loss of biodiversity in, um, in agriculture. And one of the biodiversity, of course, 40% of insects are at risk of going extinct according to a, um, a recent paper, Biological Conservation, um, last year. But we also know that the birds are vanishing, even the common species of birds are vanishing and alarming rate. And so we think that regenerative agriculture, if positioned right, could be a pathway to restoring biodiversity, bird biodiversity, and let me just check the comments there in case there's anything. Okay. Um, restoring bird um, bird biodiversity on the landscape, but that's if it's done right. And this is this is really the crux of why um, you know why General Mills is here trying to engage. Is we are here to learn uh, how to position a regenerative agriculture in this way. So it it revolves around these these five principles that are all about context. Uh, that that at its core is about implementing context. So first off, we know we need to minimize soil disturbance. We need to create um, the soil structure that biology that biology depends on, and if we're disturbing soils through heavy tillage and cultivation, um, you know we know that's just highly destructive to soil biology and soil health. We also need to minimize, of course, pesticides and insecticides in the landscape. And with regenerative agriculture, we found that things like insecticides can be virtually eliminated. So um, that is one of the key principles. Another is 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 uh, increasing crop diversity in both rotations um, as well as in mixtures, having more mixtures on the landscape. This this not it feeds greater biology and, and biodiversity above ground, but then also below ground. Um, we need to have the soil covered uh, to create that environment for, for healthy soil. You know, when soil is sitting out there baking in the sun, that's not going to support biology. And so, and then I'll, you know, along those lines, um, having living roots in the ground year round really puts those exudates into the ground. That feeds soil health. So a lot of this is focused around soil health, but biodiversity above and below ground is so critical to soil health, especially that below ground biodiversity. And then lastly, you know, integrating livestock, as we talked about when, when done right and in a natural whole um, rotational grazing system, integrated livestock uh, can be a tool for restoring ecosystems and potentially for creating habitat. Uh, I shouldn't say potentially, but there's a lot of research showing that, that rotational grazing can support for a lot of different species of grassland birds. And so I'll just advance my slide here. There we go. Uh, the regenerative agriculture is an outcomes-based approach. We are working to employ these, deploy these uh, nature-based solutions to drive these outcomes and many more. And one of them, of course, is, is biodiversity, but, but talking about soil health and water and farmer economic resiliency gives gives context, um, gives context about how are we going to possibly drive adoption and, and, and have more of this conservation adopted by farmers on the land. 
And that's really what I would like to talk about now is how do we drive adoption and how can we gear regenerative agriculture to support bird conservation? So just to talk about a little bit about how we, how we change those mindsets of farmers um, who've been practicing current conventional practices for decades. Well, we have sort of a two-pronged approach and it involves data, it involves having a trusted advisor. We work with understanding ag who are the leaders in regenerative agriculture to, to and, and have practiced successfully practice regenerative agriculture to restore profitability on their farms. They work one-on-one -on -one with farmers in our pilots to walk them through the process of relearning how to use observation, uh, how to adaptively manage their farms so we can move them from a formulaic input-based agro agronomic system to an adaptive management-based system that cons holistically considers not only profit, but other environmental factors or environmental factors that are ultimately key to long-term profitability, things like biodiversity and soil health and water and water quality. So, so we work with them on coaching them on these practices. But the other thing we do is we take measurements to quantify impact. Because if we are not regenerating these outcomes, then we truly are not regenerative. Um, regenerative agriculture is an outcomes-based initiative. And so along the way, we need to measure these outcomes. And, and, and central to that is bird conservation. Uh, this is where the action is happening on the ground. We have three pilots that have been announced publicly. Um, these center on oats in the Northern Plains uh, dairy in, in Michigan, where we source for Yoplait, and then wheat in central Kansas. And these, um, you know, these are these are the ones we've announced to date. I will mention that even though we have only three dairies in the pilot to date, I will just make the side note that that actually represents about 15 to 20 percent of our of our raw fluid milk for North America. So, so dairies become heavily consolidated, and that's the environment that we work with is these large scale dairies. This work would not be possible without the ecosystem of measurement and coaching and other partners that we uh, have engaged with to, to, um, to, to drive adoption and to measure these outcomes. And now I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the outcomes that we are working to measure now that we've talked a little bit about driving adoption. So birds are a key outcome uh, that we are working to measure. I'll talk in a second about how, we're, how we actually are measuring those. Um, and, but before I get to that, I wanna talk first about how do you gear regenerative agriculture to help bird conservation? So we know that many of these species, of course, are, are grassland obligates, and, uh, but also we know that many species use um, cultivated fields. Uh, cultivated fields can be a, uh, an environment for breeding, but as you can see from the picture on the left, they can also present um, as a potential population sink. If birds breed and, and nest in these habitats only to have uh, harvest uh, destroy those habitats or those, those, um, those nests. So, so one of the tools in regenerative agriculture we want to think about is um, habitat refugia. We want to think about flushing birds. Uh, we want to think about um, creating you know, other habitats uh, in rotation, such as, such as full season grazed, rotationally grazed cover crops and other sorts of mixtures of crops that when we start to diversify the landscape, we can start to create, potentially create these refugia. Um, we're, I feel like we're on the bleeding edge of kind of the understanding here of how do we manage these landscapes holistically, but it's our hope that through the roadmap that we can work together to learn uh, how we can do this and how we can minimize um, the effects of agriculture and make this really a net positive for birds. So just a little bit more on our work stream. We have, like I mentioned, we've established these pilots and we are tracking uh, bird breeding through kind of standard breeding bird surveys uh, to understand first off if birds are breeding in these in these fields and what species are there and then to do follow-up surveys to see can we actually document um, successful uh, fledging and, and nesting in these areas we're trying to understand not just the effects of some species but really understand the whole effect on the whole community because we know we understand of course that different guilds and different species are going to respond differently some will be more sensitive and impacted than others and we really need to understand that and then we ultimately need to provide guidance um, along with this pilot to to gear regenerative agriculture to have potential the greatest positive impacts on birds. 
we're trying to look at, uh, think beyond just breeding birds and kind of classic methods for measuring birds and think to things like acoustic recording units that have improved in value or in efficiency in recent years and can be a way of taking kind of continuous measurement of, of birds and give us higher resolution on the occurrence of certain species. And so we've deployed, for example, in our Kansas wheat pilot, we deployed 40 of these across, um, across fields in our pilot as well as reference sites just this last spring. And ultimately, we want to go from understanding fields to really understanding regenerative agriculture in this context of the mosaic uh, or the matrix of habitats out there. So we can manage, effectively manage uh, for greater bird biodiversity. And this will involve, I think, de remote, detection, remote detection of habitat practices, which we're working on. Um, this will involve us understanding the, the greater context of habitat around these, around these fields working on building, uh, building out landscape models um, to predict how advancing regenerative can ultimately drive conservation across our supply chain. Moving towards our goal of trying to advance regenerative on 1 million acres by 2030, I should have mentioned earlier. And then, and then deploying, of course, uh, highly efficient um, tools for, for passive measurement and, and increasing the resolution of the data that we have. So I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, we're here to, to learn um, from the roadmap and to contribute from the roadmap and engage as, as a food company that's dedicated to sustainability broadly, but specifically to, to bird conservation and understand where can we intersect, where can our activities intersect, where are the synergies, how do we gear regenerative for net positive impact on birds. And how do we how, how do we build something that's going to work not just for grasslands but is going to work for the broader landscape and and multiple stakeholders? And so with that, I'll pass it back to to Matt and thank everyone for um, the opportunity to be here. Thank you. My name is Carrie Gibson, and I'm a manager of State Government Affairs for Conica Phillips. I'm excited to be here today. Good afternoon to all of you. Our heritage of environmental care goes back more than a century. Both Conoco and Phillips were founded in Oklahoma, part of America's heartland. So we have heartland values, such as awareness to the wonders of nature around us. Our early operations were on the prairies and often in areas vital to migrating birds. So habitat preservation was a natural interest. And that's been handed down through the generations of our company and employees. Conoco Phillips is committed to stewardship of our Earth's environmental endowment. We consider this essential to earning what we call our license to operate. In short, that's society's permission for us to conduct business, but frankly, beyond that, we believe it's the right thing to do. Our employees live in the areas where we produce natural gas and oil. They are embedded into the cultural fabric of those communities that depend upon thriving wildlife populations. On the weekends, we enjoy being outdoors. We hike, we camp, we hunt, and we fish. Our livelihoods would be impacted just like yours if these populations were to be listed. After all, we've seen the magic in the faces of our children when they catch a gla glimpse of birds in flight. As I listened to the summit launch last week, it was incredibly motivating to accept the challenge that we have at hand. I believe an international effort quite like this is unprecedented. Three countries and multiple states with key stakeholder groups represented, it's quite phenomenal. It's an amazing opportunity to join this distinguished panel today. Next year, the company will celebrate our 30 year long history with the Playa Lakes Joint Venture Board. And our support of NIFWIF spans multiple decades. Personally, I grew up in a ranching family on the land where my dad still runs cattle with a little assistance from my family. One day we will be able to um, inherit this land and we'll be the eighth generation to do so. I wanted to share this pictures of my dad showing cattle when he was young, along with my sisters and I. I grew up in 4-H showing cattle and I totally admit and realize that this is a whole different facet of the beef industry. But because of this experience, I can relate firsthand to the importance of keeping these lands in operation and the extent of collaboration that must take place in order to advance common conservation goals. Like you, we know our job is never done, but also like you, we remain committed to protecting the environment that we share. 
We work with strategic partners to invest, invest in voluntary projects that contribute to the management of areas of national and international conservation significance. This includes partnering with communities and institutions to advance conservation efforts, practices, and build skills essential to slowing and ultimately reversing species decline. This deep commitment to species and habitat conservation is important to our operations, and it is integrated into the planning, exploration, development, and production of the lifespan of our assets. Since 2014, our spend on environmental philanthropy has been $40 million, but ConocoPhillips support doesn't just end with our charitable donations. Our employees and our leaders continue to take an active role in helping to support and steward projects and programs to preserve this national treasure. ConocoPhillips has been a proud supporter of Yellowstone National Park for over 100 years. Our decades-long partnership with NIFWIF promotes leading-edge solutions to improve habitat quality and landscape connectivity in ways that facilitate migrations of birds and mammals. We fund three important programs, but there's one that I want to, um, that will be of primary interest to you. Our Spirit of Conservation program is structured to conserve, protect, and restore important avian species habitat and support development of innovative conservation tools and practices. Since 2005, ConocoPhillips NIFWIF and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have invested in programs with a total impact of over $40 million in the conservation of more than 315,000 acres of important fish and wildlife habitat. We also work with the world-renowned Smithsonian Institute to collect migratory connectivity information for several bird species of concern. This has provided information regarding unknown migrations, tested new conservation technologies, and advanced research collaboration across the Western Hemisphere. We support seven migratory bird joint venture partnerships that help protect species that are critical, species in critical habitat essential for survival. Since 2006, we have approximately provided $4 million in grants to support projects that protect, restore high quality sites, reduce barriers to wildlife passage, and improve conservation practices. The diversities of partners that these JVs bring to the table to deliver tangible solutions for conservation on the ground is the reason that we have joined this collaborative approach. We welcome the opportunity to fund the JV8 effort. And while we have a great deal of work ahead of us, Mike will discuss the incredible groundwork that has been laid through this effort. And we thank Mike a bunch for his leadership on this. As the largest private owner of wetlands in the US, we're dedicated to preserving wetlands and protecting vulnerable wildlife and their habitats. Through our partnership with Ducks Unlimited, we have provided more than $8 million since 2012 to help manage, restore, and preserve wildlife wetlands. Through our support, restoration projects have enhanced more than 186,000 acres of wetlands along the Gulf Coast. Our relationship with the Bird Conservancy dates back to 2006, mainly through our Spirit of Conservation program but we have increased our engagement with Tammy and her team in recent years because we believe they play a pivotal role in the grasslands equation. We are keenly interested to see results from their monitoring program. The radio telemetry network in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert to monitor grassland birds. Speaking frankly, we're considering we're in the oil and gas business we have much more to learn from each one of you about conservation and migration. We are open and receptive to your input. As I transition into the outcomes that we would like to see from this summer, ConocoPhillips would like to see two important things. The first one is to build upon the momentum from the summit with more collaboration. And the second is a large scale conservation effort with secured federal funding. 
Our task at hand is a large and important one. Developing a roadmap for conservation endorsed together through collaboration by allowing everyone a seat at the table is critical to the decision-making process. From our perspective, these conservation efforts cannot be siloed. There's just way too much at stake. I wish that I could take credit for this phrase, but someone from the conservation community said, we're tired of documenting extinctions. I think many of us feel that way. We're working on a map. We're working to map out the full migratory life cycle. As an investor in this landscape, we would like to have a better idea of where our return will come from, where to refer focus conservation dollars. Without understanding migratory connectivity, conservation investment can be ineffective because they are implemented at the wrong place or at the wrong time or even for the wrong purpose. Further regulatory or policy decisions based on missing or inconclusive scientific data have the potential to negatively impact our industry and or our license to operate. Take lessons learned from previous successful ventures. For example, the Sage Grouse Initiative. As you are probably aware, this program launched in 2010 and is a partnership-based science-driven effort that is part of the Working Lands for Wildlife, which is led by USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. SGI applies the power of the farm bill to lands where habit, habitats are intact and sage grouse numbers are the highest. To date, NRCS has partnered with 1,856 ranchers to conserve more than 7 million acres across 11 western states. This is quite an impressive nature. My day job is in government affairs. And as you look across the grassland strip, there are Democrats and Republicans who represent those communities. I don't know about you, but I can use an incredible success story to get behind its support. What an incredible opportunity awaits us. This summit is international and the momentum is building. It's up to the delegates to build upon it. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to join the discussion, and I look forward to answering your questions. Hi, Matt, thank you very much, and thank you to Tammy. Let me see if I can get you to share my screen. Yep, coming up. All right. Excellent. All right, well, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Tammy, and I want to thank all the sponsors for the summit, as well as the others on the panel. And I should give a big thanks to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Rocky Mountain staff and team, uh, Chris West and uh, Seth Gallagher, I work very closely with them, and those guys are the brains behind the operation. So anybody out there who's watching, if you haven't met them, you have to. Uh, they're fantastic, and I'm sure if you have a NIFWF grant or interacted with us, those are the guys. So I do want to thank them for everything they've done out there and, and keeping us tracked. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is talk a little bit about NIFWF and kind of that role that we play within the sector and how we try to be a platform for partnerships and then dive into um, one of the examples of one of our programs that involve others from the panel in terms of bringing partners together and trying to measure outcomes. Um, so that's where I'll go. Let's get started. So a little bit about NIFWF. So who we are, we're, we're actually we're a, a 501c3 nonprofit, but we're also we're created by Congress. So we're kind of this pseudo uh, connection to the federal government. Uh, we were chartered by Congress. We have 30 board members. Two of them are from the federal government. So we have 28 private citizens, but then two federal uh, agencies that sit on the uh, board itself. And so what that does, it allows us to create uh, relationships with the federal sector and build uh, cooperative agreements through funding agreements with them. But at the same time, as a nonprofit, we have to go out and fundraise uh, with non-federal entities to match those dollars. Uh, what we do is we then, our mandate tells us to bring folks together to create common goals. And uh, what we do is pretty much put projects on the ground. We don't litigate, we don't advocate. So what that allows us uh, what you just kind of heard from Carrie is allow us to bring Democrats, Republicans, and everybody together, uh, all different administrations and all different corporations and foundations together, because we really focus 
uh, to put on the ground conservation um, on the ground and not go into litigation, things like that. Um, the map itself shows you we are region-based. Uh, these maps are not uh, set in stone. For example, Chris and Seth clearly work in a landscape and it's not a state uh, boundary, but it's more of a landscape. So a lot of their work dies into Texas, dies into Nevada and Washington. These maps were really created many years ago at NIFWIP just to give us boundaries of where our regional directors are mainly responsible for. So we have significant regions of which the Rockies is a, is a fairly big region for us. In terms of investments, we've funded since our inception. So we're about a little over 35 years old and we put about 20,000 projects on the ground. And we do that, we don't go out there and do that. We fund organizations, many probably watching the summit uh, to because we need to invest into the local organizations, the national organizations who really get the job done on the ground. Um, and at any given time, we have about 2,500 projects under management. So one interesting thing about NIFWIP is we have this machine behind us that allows us to track and monitor and assess uh, a, a number of grants at any given time. So how do we do that? These grants are not um, just random acts of kindness, but they're actually interconnected and they're interconnected in various ways. And, and the first way is through partnership. And kind of to go back to Carrie's example when she was talking about the, the um, Spirit of Conservation program, that is a really good example we can use here to show how we bring partners to the table. In that case, we um, partner, we basically provide a, a, a platform for non-federal partners to come together. In that instance, you have Conical Phillips coming in. And as she mentioned, we have the Fish and Wildlife Service coming in on the other side. And what we're doing is providing that foundation to build a public-private partnership, as well as science-based strategies. And what that does is it brings the partners to the table who have various goals and work together to establish a common goal. And then from there, those resources are put on the ground through competitive grant programs, um, and they're guided by these business plans that were approved by the partners. And what this does is it really stimulates not just the existing uh, funding partners, but others to come to the table. Since then, we've had NRCS come to the table. Uh, we've had other parts of Department of Interior come to the table. We've had foundations. So it really galvanizes interest because it's providing some sense of partnership, leverage, and goals very similar to where the Grassland Roadmap is, is going. In terms of the, the role we play is we are working across 16 federal agencies and uh, 45 plus uh, corporations and foundations. So um, these all kind of work together in, in various programs that we have across the country. And it's, it's an art, really, what Chris and Seth do is an art bringing the partners together because Everybody has different mandates and requirements, and what we try to do is, is find that commonality. So we're very excited about this grassland uh, roadmap because, again, anything that provides us boundaries that we can work in uh, is extremely helpful. And we have a very similar, at NIFWF, uh, what we call the conservation framework. So it's a, it's a very similar uh, framework that's being discussed here at the summit, but what it has is four main pillars that are really important to us as well as to our partners. The first is science-driven strategies. We have to have it based in science. I mean, we, have, we don't want random acts of kindness, but we want interconnections of the projects that we support. A lot of this is based on data, and in some cases, we need more information and more data to make the right decision of where we need to focus our efforts. Um, once we have uh, an idea of the focal areas and the strategies, the partners come together, and we need resources then to leverage those activities within those science-based approach. From there, we use a um, partner with those on the ground to get the impacts that we need, collecting the, the metrics around um, easements and land protection and better land management. And all of that goes into something we call a scorecard, which allows us to track these outcomes to ensure that the activities that we're doing are getting some response from a species perspective. And if they're not, we need to readapt. And so from a grasslands perspective, we actually have a strategy and, and this is a Venn diagram I like to show that um, basically touches on the key pieces. And earlier Jim was mentioning those nature-based solutions, but he also talked about the really important part of the, the economic drivers behind it. And so NIFWF's role typically is in the green box with the nature-based solution. What our goal is is to bring nature, to bring grasslands, to bring habitats, to the table when we're trying to discuss solutions. But, but we always know that to be really successful, you have to intersect 
also with the economic drivers and activity. So that could be ranchers, that can be farmers, that can be the local community, as well as engage with the community on the ground because you need to build trust. So what we try to do is bring these solutions to the table, work within the economic drivers, uh, as well as sometimes constraints, and then engage the community to have buy-in. And the, uh, I, I, the, these are programs on the outside. We have a Working Lands Program, we have a Pecos Initiative, a Monarchs Program, the ConocoPhillips Spirit Conservation, and the Northern Great Plains. All of these add up to about uh, $20 million in investments that we, we put into grasslands. And as a national organization, we fully identify the critical needs in the grasslands. We are fully invested. Um, you know, we, five years ago, I don't think we had a staff or office in, in the Rockies, and we have staffed up and, and really have focused in this area um, and hopefully become a resource and, and, and uh, a partner with others to, to really drive towards common goals. So let me just drive into the Northern Great Plains uh, just to give you an example of how do we measure outcomes. Um, and so just so you guys know, I was with the federal government for 15 years before I came to NIFWIF, and before that I was in academia. And when I was in the federal government, I, I worked for NOAA, and I, I love the organization, but we were really focused on metrics. You know, we kept on focusing on how many acres restored or, or shorelines or wetlands restored. But it came to the point when what's, what's enough? Like, how do you know, like, what is the goal that we're driving towards? Is, is more better? And where should we be focusing? And we never quite got to that uh, indicator that told us that. And so what we've done at NIFWIP is really try to um, define that goal and using species as our indicator. So let me talk a little bit about that. So the Northern Great Plains is a, a, a geography, it's a landscape we have that we built a business plan around. It's a 10 year business plan. And it focuses on five states, really focus on it. And you see the map here on the right of the uh, different grasslands that we're focusing on. Focusing on. On the bottom are the partners, and you can see there's a mix of corporate, federal, and, and, and other foundations. So they all come together, they pool their resources, because we all know there's never enough, um, and we build together a common goal around the Northern Great Plains. Basically, we keep grass in grass, you know, keep, keep, it, keep it going, and where we can protect it, and where we can um, continue to improve it, we do that. Um, these are the three main strategies that we um, fund in the Northern Great Plains. It's habitat protection, it's improved management, and restoring unproductive cropland um, where we can. And so to date, we're in our fourth year of this business plan and we funded about 100 grants within the geography. And we've also incorporated monitoring. So what happens with those uh, 94 grants? So basically, the business plan has habitat goals. And so we have a number of goals. I'm only presenting two here that are, are of, of significance, but basically we have an acres improved under management goal of 5 million acres, and then acres protect under easements about a million. And we selected these in, in various uh, focal areas based on scientific information around grassland burns. So, you know, where should we be doing protection and where are there opportunity to improve management? And so we're in our fourth year, and as you can see, the grants that we funded, those grantees are ticking along. And if anybody's a grantee, you know when you get and if with grant, we ask you for your metrics. Well, that's exactly where these go. And all the different grant, all those dots on the map are interlinked within our scorecard and our business plan. So they're not differently random projects, but as we sit down with our partners to select those grants, we really focus on where are we gonna maximize our investment in terms of improving management, improving grasslands and protecting grasslands. Um, so then as we tick along, then how do we know if we're on track? Well, we've created a species goal, and what we've uh, predicted through uh, modeling protocols is to see when we put, when we improve grassland and we increase the capacity of that grassland to support a certain number of birds, we want to bring that up to a level where it can support um, enough birds to be what we would consider productive. Now, um, let me give you an example of where we've done this. So, of those grants, a number of them we've funded in, in this chart, you'll see the x-axis has a control, has an investment, and has a region. So the control is a control site within our focal areas where we have not done any improved management on grasslands. And the investment site is an area where we have done improved management in our uh, focal areas. And the region is basically an overall 
um, general uh, region level of density for the Northern Great Plains. And as you can see here, now this is very pre preliminary, but what it tells us is that as we continue to do improved management, that is working with ranchers to do uh, better management, um, basically um, being productive, uh, but also being productive in, in, in benefiting birds. And here you can see that the investment actually is statistically higher than what we get from the control site. So the good news is we know that it's working, but there's still a lot more to do and, and a lot more information that we need, we need to gain. Um, and that leads me to this next slide, which I think is my last slide, which talks about where do we go from here? And, and as we look at a, at a framework for grasslands, we really need to look at the entire life cycle. And I think we heard a little bit that from that from Jim early on, and I know we're gonna hear about it from Mike, is that we really need to look at how, what are these birds doing both in, in winter and summer? You know, what, where are they going? And so that's gonna help us better understand where we need to invest. Where do we need to have those focal areas? So we have a better understanding, more data to know where these birds are going. So then we can, as a community, work together to put improved management um, easements and so forth in those places so we can improve the overall um, populations of these birds. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, I put Seth's information here because as I said earlier, these guys are the ones that have all the knowledge in the region. Um, but uh, if there's further, uh, I'll answer questions today, but obviously going forward, uh, Seth and Chris are your, are your leads. So this is uh, Mike Carter. Uh, I'm the coordinator for the Ply Lakes Joint Venture, and I'm here representing the uh, JVA Grassland Initiative. And I just want to start off with this map and say that's a great concept. Um, joint ventures coming together to address that landscape. Um, my goal today, though, is to take you much beyond a concept and really fill you in on details about what the JV8 is all about. One of the first things that I want to mention, okay, I skipped a slide there. Um, the, the next slide is uh, all the coordinators that are involved in the JV8. That's just not projecting, but it's been really, really wonderful to work with these people. I'll show their names here again in a minute. But then the second question is why are joint ventures in the, in the sectors part of, of the program? And really joint ventures are, are the place where partnerships are built um, by the very name joint venture, it's where people come together. So we did a quick survey of our management boards and just on our management boards, we represent 72 entities. When we start doing projects, the number starts going to 200, 300 directly involved and literally thousands of others that, that are involved in the joint venture program. So I wanna talk about birds just a little bit and ask everybody to superimpose that image on their brain, the Northern extent, the Southern extent, the Southwest extent, and then just look at how the joint ventures are positioned under the JV8 initiative. And those are the folks and those are the authors of, of this talk right here. And this is, these are the people that are building the JV8 program but almost a perfect overlap with um, lark buntings and the ability to address that landscape and birds that, that move among that landscape. And just a, a quick um, shout out to the birds that are involved here. Um, we have uh, Canada involved, we have US involved, and we have Mexico involved. But if you look at these birds, these are tri-national birds. These are the birds of North America. These are the birds that are nearly endemic to, the, to this area. This is our responsibility as North Americans to really um, save the populations of, of these birds. So what has the JV8 done so far? Um, actually, the spin-up began quite a while ago with funding from ConocoPhillips and the Fish and Wildlife Service was to produce an assessment and I'll talk about the assessment here in a, in a minute. We're currently in phase two, um, going through interviews for candidates, and we, we expect those, that person to be in place in the first, second week of August. From then, we'll go into a full-on implementation phase. So here's, here's a result of the assessment. And I'm just going to hit it really, really broadly here, but the, the red curves there are loss of habitat 
and the blue curves there or lines are the rate of protection. And then the green is the amount of protected habitat in each joint venture. And so th this kind of stuff is just pure joint venture work. And it really gives you speedometers of where you are. Uh, Ply Lakes Joint Venture is there in the middle and I'm going to be talking specifically about that graph here in a second. But my goal is to go through each joint venture and tell you something about what they're doing for the JV8 initiative. So when I talk about what the JV8 initiative is, we sh I showed you the work plan, but really behind the scenes, what we'll be doing is to scale up what works best, um, develop programs that are missing, probably most importantly of all, learn from each other, and then foster regional solutions um, or local solutions. It can go either way, local to regional, regional to local. And then I think what joint ventures really bring to the whole idea is to right size acres and funding that uh, will give you the cold hard facts of what it's going to take to recover these birds. We also believe it's very, very important to keep people on the landscape. Um, we're with these people, we're supportive of folks out there trying to make a living and, and we want them to stay on the landscape. And then finally, the JV8 really takes a genuine approach to a tri-national approach with at least two binational, three binational joint ventures involved in addressing all three countries. So here's the first JV slide. These are going to go very, very quickly, just uh, kind of focus on the yellow there, but PLJV only has 1.19% of its landscape protected. We'd like to get to 5%. We'd like to do that in a decade working with ConocoPhillips and Fish and Wildlife Service. We're giving grants to agricultural land trusts and those land trusts are all operating at about 50,000 acres a year. At a full build out of the program, we would have six grantees generating about 300,000 a year acres. And in that way, that's how we would, would make this goal of increasing the protection in PLJV. As far as an outreach and communications example, I'm, I'm totally enamored with this um, example from the Northern Great Plains Joint Venture where Dan Casey has gone county by county, conservation district by conservation district, talking about the needs of birds, the habitat goals, and trying to build programs around conservations at very local scales. Outstanding example of um, outreach and communications. We were talked a lot about sustainable agriculture. This example is from the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. Um, the idea that working with the ag community directly to make um, activities more sustainable, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, Sustainable Crops, and actually using human dimensions or social science data to figure out what's important to people. Very important effort coming out of Canada. Many people have heard about the GRIP program, the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program. This is the home of GRIP, Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. Lots and lots of big numbers there. But what they've developed is a very practical program to receive funding, work with landowners to restore grasslands, and then evaluate those results. Um, these guys get it as far as putting habitat on the ground. Speaking of getting it, um, Prairie Pothole Joint Venture, the home of uh, wetland bird conservation is really stepping up on land birds. Um, again, supported by ConocoPhillips and Fish and Wildlife Service have produced this plan. But where it really becomes meaningful is when you look at something like the decline of Sprague's Pippet and how many acres you have to put on the ground each year to reverse that trend. And it looks like a long drawn out effort there. But for me, I'm totally enamored with the idea of someone telling me that it's going to take 25 years to make this happen and to have the numbers and be able to demonstrate how it's going to happen. It is so, so different than someone saying, well, we just need to put more habitat on the ground. 
And then as far as how you put habitat on the ground, this is an example from Rainwater Basin Joint Venture. Um, how do we make habitat for 13.5 million grassland birds? And we do that through managing eastern red cedar invasions. We have an annual, a goal of 420,000 acres annually. And then to keep the grass and the invasion from hap invasion happening into the grassland, have a fire re uh, return frequency of one to 10 years with an ultimate goal of 500,000 acres of grassland being um, uh, developed. Then speaking of binational, um, this is re really a great example from the Rio Grande Joint Venture. Um, taking everything that is known from the joint venture community and developing a plan that operates binationally. Um, this is incredibly important as far as binational work to take what is done really well in one country or what is done really well in another country and combining that into a strategy that works for both countries and works for these birds that move among the countries. And then finally, an example of evaluation. The joint venture is really strong on evaluation. This one from Sonoran Joint Venture. Um, it's critically important to understand what data you have before you do more monitoring and make sure that you are already evaluating the effects of things that you're doing out there. So this is the Borderlands Avian Data Center. Also an outstanding binational effort. Um, the idea of understanding and collecting data among two countries is just amazing work. Um, the URL is down there if you'd like to visit that. So we, we were asked some questions for the summit. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I think this is something that could be dropped into the summit document um, as far as uh, the tone of the joint venture work, the tone of the habitat work. Um, I'll hit a couple of them there. I think the top one that we really need fully functioning planning, implementation, and evaluation cycles. We're very often good at doing one part of that, but some of the, the things you heard from Nick, uh, Holly are, are very important. Um, it's just words on the page, but serious goals and serious attention paid to them. I mean, we're probably talking about 200 million acres as a start to recover these birds and you convert that to dollars, that's probably what we're really, really looking at. And that brings me to the last one there about right-sized funding that we need to really go out in the world to do bird conservation with um, the right, right kind of funding and the right amount of funding. And I think I wanna really hit um, the idea of win-win approaches, working with ranchers, working with farmers and making sure they understand that we're working for their well-being as well. So I'll bring it back to the sectors here. Um, the joint ventures are already working with, with many of these, these sectors. I just want to put a shout out to the corporations and sectors and foundations that are, that are already at the joint venture table and then just make sure that everybody understands that that door is um, wide open. Joint ventures are where the partnerships happen. Joint ventures are where the habitat work happens. And so with that, um, if I went through this whole um, show without really telling you what a joint venture is, you can check it out at, at that link and learn more about joint ventures. And I hope I brought you from the concept of the JV8 to the real details of the JV8 and demonstrated that we're really ready to help with uh, implementing the roadmap, everything from habitat to communications to um, goals and objectives for these birds. So thank you very much for your time. Now, but Mike, I, I think your talk is a great jumping off point in terms of one of the questions that came in from an attendee in terms of other species. So there's great infrastructure out there um, for birds and a, and a lot of work going on in that realm. Um, and the roadmap is going to scale up to be um, bigger, than, bigger than birds too and impacting other species, um, soil, plant health, um, other biodiversity. So for any of the panelists, um, how can we learn from the structure of the, the JVs that's been created and, and how can the roadmap impact and be, um, be doing work for, for, all, for a number of species that are out there, a number um, of different pieces of, of the grasslands. 
I'll, I'll start just because I maybe talked about birds, but um, very much what Arvind Punjabi said at the top of this, of the canary in the, the coal mine, birds are easily countable, they're easily viewable, and they're indicators of what's going on. But all of the joint ventures are really conscious of um, water issues and other issues in the landscape. And so we know we're benefiting those, and to a very large degree, some of those species are carried along in our planning. I'll jump in next. I think, you know, whenever Mike showed that slide uh, that, that talks about not just the JV makeup, but the partners that all sit at the table. I mean, you know, I think it's scale and I think it's leveraging, um, I think it's leveraging every bit of that, right? I mean, you know, we've talked, I talked a lot about collaborative conservation, but I think the reason why we have been investing in the JV8 model is because of that scale that represents you know, you talk about AJVs and then it's exponential whenever you add all the, the um, partners that sit on the JV board. So getting that next level of buy-in as JV8 moves into that phase two and beyond, um, I think is critical. Yeah, this is Holly. I think um, just to add to the comments we've heard, you know, to me it's a good model because there's a model of success in the past. If you go back to NACA, and you go back to, um, you know, ducks and migratory birds, and there is a success. You know, a lot of the grassland birds, you know, shorebirds, seaboard, you know, all of a sudden there's a success story. Why is that? Because, <laughs> sorry, Mike, I know, <laughs> but why is that? It's because um, there was a, co well, one, there was resources, right? Uh, and so we have to figure out how to get that kind of resources for grassland birds. But when you have a cohesive group of people uh, leveraging each other around a common goal and identifying those focal areas and, and then not also knowing how much is enough and where to focus that, there are nuggets of success. And I think that's the value of looking at the big, you know, the JVA to say, okay, there's a success out there that we can look to model, it's the not, similar to NACA, and we could do that here. Um, and then the question is, you know, how do we get there? And I think the roadmap is going to help us uh, galvanize that. Those, those are all really great points. And I'll just add that, you know, as we think about how do we advance regenerative, how we do it today is with, um, with coaching. And, and we're trying to bring regenerative agriculture to support bird conservation. But as we think about ways of working, you know, the flip of that is, well, how can we bring bird conservation to regenerative agriculture? So how can we kind of embed those like multiple benefits of uh, bird conservation, the programs that you were talking about, Mike, and others have talked about um, to work with farmers more closely and to work with them, you know, primarily with a go with the initial goal of, of bird conservation, but expanding out to all these other benefits. Um, yeah, just like different ways of working, and ultimately we're trying to get to the same place, which is a, which are functioning working landscapes that are great for biodiversity as a whole, and um, and kind of figuring out those ways of working is is um, a big reason why we you know we're we're really excited to be a part of this. Great, thank you all. Uh, another question that came in, um, really I think for, for Conoco and General Mills, but I, I think it relates to this topic and thinking about collaboration that everyone is coming together to work on these different pieces. Um, but are there things that, that ConocoPhillips and General Mills and others are able to do to influence um, other corporations and, and other partners that are out there to, to step up and do the same level of work that, that you're all doing? Yeah, I'll jump in um, initially. I mean, I think, I think it's all about relationships. I mean, you know, we, um, especially putting my government affairs hat on, I mean, everything that we do, we do in collaboration with a lot of other companies. And so, you know, Tammy and I have spent a lot of time brainstorming about what are the different companies and what are the perspectives and cultures of those different companies that we can set up meet and greets and try to work uh, two different angles within those companies. So it's the philanthropic angle and then it's also the sustainability angle on, you know, here's this opportunity for engagement for you and here's this opportunity of really great work and proven results um, 
that have been successful. And so, you know, certainly I think that there's huge opportunity and we've only scratched the surface within the oil and gas community on how we can engage and, and leverage those relationships. And I think that there's a lot more that we can do for the broader energy sector um, uh, because I think that it needs to, it needs to, I mean, you look at the map, right? It's not just oil and gas. There's the whole energy sector has a component of this. And so I look forward to, um, you know, working closer with Tammy to try and figure out what are those different uh, venues that we can pursue. And of course, agriculture has a big uh, piece of that as well. Yeah, that's really great, Carrie. And I'll, I'll just build on that by absolutely. We, um, we view sustainability as a pre-competitive space for us to engage with our peers and um, food and beverage uh, to, you know, work, not only work together, but you know, for General Mills to set, you know, lead by example. And, and so we, uh, you know, want to share information um, in sustainability. We want to, you know, try to drive those goals. And I think the example that we can set here with the roadmap, I hope will be um, motivating to other food companies that can, can join us. Yeah, Mike, Mike or Holly, anything from, from your perspective as you've brought in different partners and folks into your work? No, I mean, just a shout out to ConocoPhillips and everybody that's been working with us. They really, they really do do this work. Um, carry on the public relations side, they're hot, active on the hill. And so it's just not, you know, everybody on the bandwagon, they're actually doing this work and I actually believe when they say these things that they're gonna bring more corporations to the table. It's really, really exciting and really, really gratifying. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I would have to agree. And, and you know, we, in the past, in, in some of our programs, uh, usually the Fed resources would come to the table first, and that would be a really good incentive to bring the non-Fed. But I have to say, in a lot, what we're seeing now is a flip, and particularly uh, with, um, you know, oil and gas, in a sense, where they're stepping up, and their presence is now bringing in some of the, the federal agencies to the table. So it's kind of nice when, you know, I think when you know, Billy comes to the party, then Jane comes to the party, you know, it's like, who's, who, who's, who's coming to the party? And so that, I think that uh, the leadership we've seen from, you know, the, the ag industry, uh, food industry, oil and gas industry, others, has really helped um, bring uh, others to the table. Great, thank you all, appreciate it. And just as a heads up to some of the attendees who can't see it, we have had some other questions come in that were very specific to, to one of the talks. We've recorded all of those. They've done a great job answering those already, and we will post those on the website so people can see some of the other questions that we won't be able, able to get to. But um, I want to invite other, other folks to ask questions at this point. Um, Jim or Seth or Tammy, if, if you've seen anything come in that, that you want to bring up, we're coming down to the, the end of our time for this panel, but just want to open it up for questions one more time at this point. I can... I can jump in with one I'd like to ask um, to Mike about you know, thinking about uh, about focusing regionally and then acting locally. Um, as you as you work to build networks out of farmers and ranchers that are working on conservation, can you talk a little bit more to the social network that you can try to create, the, the mindset shifts you can try to create in those communities and then how those can maybe scale to regions? Yeah, it, it all starts with working with people and understanding what's important to them. And so my joint venture away from the grassland um, focus has really been working on aquifers because playas recharge uh, the Ogallala aquifer. But that's how we go into the meetings and then we find champions for, for that cause. And I, I think I've heard in your talks the very, very similar approach of finding the community leaders uh, Burke Conservancy of the Rockies talks about contagious conservation, um, the idea of uh, demonstration areas, but that's where it all starts. That's where we have the capacity to do something. So no matter how local, work with people locally, build the success there, and then find the money to export it. It's been proven over and over as the way to do business. Excellent. Thanks.